Hey y'all, today I'm gonna to be working inside. You're probably gonna be finding that I'm gonna be working inside on a lot of videos coming up. It is just too darn hot to the point that it's dangerous outside. And so I will be working inside a whole lot more. I can only garden in the very early hours or the very end of the day. Their early hours are I like, I, I, they're fine to garden in. I'm not a morning person, so it's really hard for me to get up and then to be peppy on a video for you all because I'm usually dragging. I'm a night owl. I like to stay up reading. I love to read. I read constantly. And so um, getting up in the morning, I can manage to do it, but also like record a video is really hard. And then at the end of the day, and I mean like 8.30, that's when it's finally safe to kind of go out 8.30 at night. <clears throat> I am just at that point when I'm videotaping, it's dusk and it doesn't record well on the video. So that also is really hard. So you're going to find me doing a lot more videos inside for at the heat of the summer, just because um, it's dangerous and I'm struggling. It's hard. It's hard to get out there and garden. But putting that all aside, today we are going to be talking about five drought tolerant cut flowers that I grow in my garden and they've been tried and true even through triple digit temperatures. As always, make sure you hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so you know my latest videos are up and make sure you drop me a comment below. What is your favorite drought tolerant cut flower? Drought tolerant, that's key. Specifically, if you're in my type of area, I'm in zone 8A. It's rough, y'all. It's real rough. We have water restrictions. There's a lot going on. So you definitely cannot just feed and feed and feed a garden, right? You can't just water it all the time. So a lot of times we have to have drought resistant um, plants that are complementary of when we go into uh, water restrictions. All right, so I'm gonna give you my top five drought tolerant cut flowers. Now, a couple of things that I wanna say about this, the reason I'm selecting these. A couple of different things, they look good even when it's um, we're in a drought. They look really, really good. So that's super important because I don't wanna give you a flower that looks crappy, right? We want it to look beautiful in your garden. These also have long stems, so they're excellent for cut flowers and utilizing um, in arrangements, which is really, really important to me. And then they're also a flower that has interesting texture, they're unique, they're different, they're not same old, same old, which is really, really fun. And then obviously drought tolerant, they're not something that you need to be watering every morning on a daily basis. Okay, so let's start with the tried and true sunflower. Now, sunflowers can be grown in a multitude of colors. They can be um, grown at multiple different heights. I've grown a wide variety in my garden this year, including Autumn Beauty, which re reseeded itself from last year. It's a mix of heirloom sunflower seeds. Absolutely beautiful. I've done quite a few pro cuts this year and in the past. So pro cuts are actually beautiful. I can see out my window right now, all um, the white light pro cuts are blooming right now and they're absolutely beautiful. And pro cuts have done really, really well. Those are a single stem, so a single bloom plant. So they're not gonna branch off and give you multiples. I've also grown, grown a lot of munchkins this year and those are sweet, tiny little flowers. They're only about two and a half to three inches. Really, really pretty sunflowers. I like to use them in arrangements as they're not really bulky and heavy in an arrangement. They're more of an accent, which I think is kind of different and unusual. Um, so I've grown a lot of munchkins. They are also a single bloom sunflower. Another sunflower that I added to my uh, garden this year was by Proven Winners, and it is the Sun Credible. I'm doing the Sun Credible Yellow, and I'm also growing the Sun Credible Saturn. The yellow is obviously all yellow with a dark center, and the Saturn, it, the Saturn one is a dark center with yellow and then a little bit of orange kind of rimming the dark center. So it has a ring, an additional ring in there. And they've done really, really well. Now that the heat is really pumping, the Sun Credibles are doing amazing, right? I planted some, I guess, six weeks ago six, eight weeks ago, and they were fine. They were just kind of sitting around, and I was like, oh man, I don't know. Maybe they're not gonna do very well. But as soon as these triple digit temperatures hit, the Sun Credibles went bonkers. Like they're doing beautifully and they're excellent for a cut flower as well. Sunflowers are always a really great go-to for drought tolerant flowers. And you can continuously plant them, right? You can do successions. So you can do one round, like I've got a bunch of pro cuts blooming right now. As soon as I cut them, I'll immediately replace them with another seed and get another plant started. Um, and they'll bloom until we um, end up having cooler temps, but definitely until the first frost. Now, number two on my list is 
zinnias. Now, I know a lot of you guys are like, zinnias, everybody grows zinnias. There's a reason everybody grows zinnias, right? Especially in temperatures like this. It's because they're beautiful, luscious, tried and true flowers that will go and go and go, even if you're in cooler areas, but definitely when you're in hotter, drier areas like this. I've grown a wide variety of zinnias over the years. I just started a whole new round of seedlings, which I'm really excited to get, um, get out. My tried and true zinnia that comes back for me every year, meaning it reseats itself, is Purple Prince Zinnia. So if you're looking for something that's very low maintenance and will return every year for you, meaning it will reseed itself, it's not a perennial, you have to let some of the flowers dry on the plant, drop its seeds, and then the seeds will start new plants for the next year. That plant is definitely going to be a Purple Prince Zinnia. It's definitely worth going out and getting some of those seeds if you're wanting to try it because it's absolutely stunning. I also love growing polar bear zinnias. I think they're absolutely beautiful. The big, white, almost dahlia-like zinnias I think are gorgeous. I'm a huge fan of carpet zinnias as well. These are a lower zinnia. So the Purple Prince and the polar bear she's talking about, these are taller ones that are three to five feet tall. In fact, my purple princess got six feet tall last year. But carpet zinnias are lower, kind of more border plants. And I've grown a wide variety of those over the years. And I think they're absolutely beautiful. I think they add a lot of color at this time of the year when a lot of things are dying and drying up and really struggling. And so zinnias are great for that kind of beautiful, bright punch of color when things are really having a hard time. They're also absolutely beautiful in flower arrangements. I use them all the time. They're very long lasting in a vase, which I think is very fun. And then the last thing to know about zinnias is that if you allow the flower to dry on the stem, you can collect seeds and start new zinnias for yourself the following year, which I think is really great. So potentially you only have to buy one packet of zinnias one time. And then after that, you can continually harvest the seeds and start more plants in the future. The third plant on my list is a celosia, or I should say the cut flower. The third cut flower on my list is a celosia. Now, celosia is available in a wide variety of colors, sizes, shapes. Um, there's coxcomb, there's feather, there's plume. There's the ones that look like little brains. I mean, just super cool varieties of celosia, and they're very easy to grow. They're ve they do very well in the heat. Mine continually reseed themselves year after year. So I will say if you're in my area and you plan on planting some celosia, there's a good chance you're gonna have that celosia in the same place um, the following year. And there's a good chance you're gonna have celosia five feet away <laughs> as well. So it does readily reseed itself in the area, which I think is great. You know my style of gardening, so I'm totally okay if we wanna have some of that takeover. I love having to come back every year. It's simple and it's easy for me, which is great. Celosia is beautiful in cut flower arrangements. You know, that is usually one of my number one goals when I am planting things in my garden is focusing on cut flowers so I can make arrangements and bring them inside and enjoy them. And celosia is wonderful. It's also really good as a dried floral, meaning you can hang it upside down, dry it out and use it in arrangements in the winter. Now I've lost track over the years on what zinnia is, keeps reseeding itself in my <laughs> garden. It's kind of feathery looking, absolutely beautiful. One of my favorite ones I've grown is variegated, coxcomb celosia, and it is absolutely beautiful. It's kind of a yellow, pink, magenta, white, kind of all together in the bloom, absolutely beautiful. Um, I think it's a really good look. I've got some other celosia currently started that I'm gonna be planting out pretty soon. One of them is called Flamingo Feather, which I'm really looking forward to seeing. It's kind of this soft, light pink elongated bloom, which is a, a kind of a texture that I don't currently have in my garden. And I really look forward to utilizing that in arrangements. Okay, my fourth cut flower, drought tolerant cut flower is Amaranthus. Now, Amaranthus, once again, is a plant that reseeds itself in my garden. And you probably have gotten a theme because now we've talked about sunflowers, which some of them reseeded. We've talked about zinnias, which reseeded. We've talked about celosia, which reseeded. And now we're talking about amaranth, which reseeded. You might see a theme with that. I love plants that reseed themselves. It's one less step for me. I think it's fabulous. However, I can understand that some gardeners don't like that look. They want a tidier, kind of more compact or more controlled look in their gardens. 
I'm totally fine with it reseeding. I'll just pull it up if I don't want it in that particular place. Over the years, I've learned to recognize what these seedlings look like so I can get to them earlier and it's no big deal. Just pull them up whenever I want. There's also no guilt in pulling them up whenever I want because I literally, I haven't planted any more seeds in three years, right? So I've already gotten, definitely got my money's worth. There's tons of other plants. So pulling, you know, anywhere from five to 15 is no big deal for me at all. So amaranthus, I am growing bleeding heart. Amaranthus in my garden is a big burgundy kind of red feathery plume type of thing. Absolutely gorgeous. They can be massive big flowers and they can be small skinny thin flowers that grow in a wide variety of sizes and shapes. Amaranthus is really good to pinch earlier on when the plant is about 12 inches tall. If you pinch it down, leave maybe three to four sets of leaves below, pinch above a set of leaves, it will branch out and give you a big gorgeous plant. I forget to pinch mine every year and I still get a wonderful bounty of amaranthus. So if you forget to pinch, it's not the end of the world, you're still gonna get quite a bit. The other variety I have currently reseeded in my garden is called uh, actually Hot Biscuits Amaranthus. And it is kind of like a biscuit color, right? A beigey kind of neutral color, really, really pretty. I will say amaranthus suffer a lot of damage on their leaves in my garden. I have no idea what eats them, I'm not sure. And it's pretty prolific, whatever it is that's eating them. However, I don't grow amaranthus for the leaves, so it doesn't really bother me because I'm going to be pulling the leaves off anyway. I will say the leaves are very unattractive in my garden with whatever pest it is that's eating off these leaves. But I try not to stress about it because my thought process is whatever that pest is, it really likes the amaranthus and it hangs out by the amaranthus. And I'm thinking that if I went in and I treated that or I didn't grow amaranthus, I'm thinking that pest would go somewhere else, which I don't want it to, right? I'm okay with it messing with amaranthus because like I said, I don't care about the leaves, I care about the final bloom. Okay, and my fifth favorite drought tolerant cut flower is Gonfrina. Now, some of y'all might be surprised because if you've been following me for a while, two years ago, if you had asked me if I like Gonfrina, I would have said, heck no, I hate Gonfrina. <laughs> I guess tastes change over the years and you learn about different things other than the look of the plant, right, that are important to you, like the growing habit of Gonfrina. It's big and beautiful and bold, gorgeous green leaves, no matter what, no matter if it hasn't been watered in days, no matter if we haven't had rain in months, right? It's an excellent drought, uh, drought tolerant flower. I grow mainly purple globe Gonfrina, um, and it's kind of a magenta purpley color. I've also, and I really like it for its look, um, I think it's a bright, bold, beautiful color. It's beautiful in my front yard right now. A bright, bold, beautiful color adds a lot of color at a time of the year where everything's dry and dying and that type of thing. It's a very interesting type of texture to add into arrangements. I find the stems a little difficult to work with because the gonfrina stem grows straight up and then it sends off two to three shoots from that segment. So it's like a segment and it almost has like a joint and then it sends off two to three shoots, but it sends them off in like a 45 degree angle, right? So the stem is like straight and then like that. So it's a little bit harder to work with in design purposes. So that's something to kind of consider and keep in mind. Um, you have to be free with it. It's not like a tightly bunched design. Although I was thinking about challenging myself and harvesting a bunch of gonfrina because it's very prolific and creating just this beautiful, perfect little ball of gonfrina bouquet. Doesn't that sound amazing? I, I, maybe I'll challenge myself and do that in a video for you guys. But I really enjoy growing that particular variety. Now, I have grown, grown the Proven Winners Pink Truffle Gonfrina, and it wasn't a favorite of mine. The color and everything is fine. I didn't like the texture of that Gonfrina. It's more fuzzy um, looking and more looks like an insect a little bit, in my opinion. And then the smell is not that great on that pink truffle, truffle, yeah, pink truffle, that pink truffle gonfrina. I, I'm not a fan of it to the point that when I would walk by, I could smell it. And I <clears throat> wasn't interested in smelling that in my garden, right? So um, I grew that one year and then I pulled it and I haven't grown it again. It's not something I've been interested in. I would really like to grow some white gonfrina in my garden. So maybe that'll be a goal for next year. Okay, I hope you guys have enjoyed learning today my five top drought tolerant cut flowers. I've used them for multiple years, um, so they have been tried and true in my garden. I wouldn't suggest them unless I thought they were something that's great to grow in your own garden. 
Obviously, you need to look at your zone, what works best in your zone. I am zone 8A, so surrounding zones will have some success with these flowers as well. All the photos today are from my own garden or my own flower arrangements, just so you know, proof that I did grow all of these and that I do have some experience with them. As always, she's a mad gardener or decorator or anything else that she wants to be. Thanks, y'all.